Okay, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a given Thursday morning. Uh, we have the honor of dealing uh, this morning with uh, uh, Brett. Um, wait, I'm blocking on it. Etch Etchy Barn. Uh, he's a researcher, an MD researcher at MSU. Uh, that's uh, Michigan State University. He has his own lab, and he's been working on fast, uh, fast COVID tests, which is really important um, and could change. Could be a game changer. May I say that? May I say that, Brett? Yep, that's the goal. That yeah, so the goal. We, we really need that uh, in a hurry, actually, I would say. Because, you know, yes. it's the, one, the sticking point where uh, science and politics doesn't meet and you, and you really have to have this fast test. So your test is much faster um, than any other test uh, available right now. Am I right? Yes, I would say so. Or definitely up there as fast as they do seem to get. Um, I, I have seen the Abbott test uh, employed with, with fast results as well. So I know that that, that exists and has been available for some time. Um, some places are using it and others aren't. So in areas, another hospital where I work, uh, they don't use that test. They use, I think they were critical of the sensitivity issue there and decided to use a, a different, more traditional process. So therefore the, the sample processing takes a little bit longer. Mm, well, we're talking about um, new technology and a confluence of uh, possible uh, technological influences here. Uh, can you talk about um, you know, where, what the steps are in this test and uh, how you derive them and um, how they work uh, to the extent you can share them with us? Sure, sure. So um, the, the basis of our test is I was, we were chatting a little bit earlier. It's uh, based on what's called loop mediated isothermal amplification or LAMP. Uh, and this is a, I consider it an advanced PCR technology. It's, uh, I would say somewhat mature in the research field, but its utility in the actual clinical workspace has been somewhat limited so far over the 20 years or so that it has existed. So I have been intrigued by LAMP for a long time and um, kind of utilized my own bioinformatics tools to figure out where you would implement LAMP. And where I use it is to identify pathogens that cause uh, septic type infections and conditions in, in humans. So uh, my research background kind of started with this uh, bioinformatics, functional genomics, they call it. Mm -hmm. And um, I- You've used it on various antigens in the past. This, so this is something that works for uh, various other antigens, including uh, viral antigens, yeah? Exactly, so you could target bacteria, fungi, vi uh, viruses, uh, human elements, genetic elements, targeted uh, sequence elements, really generally most things that have genetic code you can employ this tool uh, to, to get the answer quickly. So uh, we, we focused on all of the bad pathogens that you would face in a normal emergency situation from my standpoint. You, can, you could theoretically die from almost anything, presumably, but there's really a list, the top 10 list of offenders that really take the humans down with, with uh, far more prevalence than the rest. So mm -hmm. uh, I've validated previously the top 50 sort of bacterial, fungal, uh, viral infections that, that we see commonly here, and uh, even some more exotic ones from down in uh, Peru, Leishmaniasis. We've adapted our tests to be uh, useful out on the Amazon River, I figured. You know, if I can make it work there, then I shouldn't really have a problem selling this as something that's a useful, portable tool. So um, that's what we've been working with for a number of You know, of one, years. one of the things uh, that's uh, interesting is that these things mutate. Before you even get to a question of virus, last year there was a, a lot of um, uh, coverage in the, in the media about, about new funguses, funguses that were ultimately fatal. Yes. Uh, fun funguses that were like MRSA, you know, that you couldn't stop them. They were resistant yep. to any drugs. Um, is this a kind of system that will identify a mutated fungus, for example? You, you can adapt that, this system to look for the mutations. I generally, in my own explorations, try to avoid areas of high mutation because, you know, if, if we're looking for the offender, again, if I need to get down to the level of mutation, 
Uh, to me, at least as, as a treating physician, if I know that it's MRSA, if I know that it's Pseudomonas, if I know that it's COVID, if I know that it's influenza, I basically know what to do. It's when you're dealing with this nebulous, could it be this? Could it? Yeah, it could be all of this. And so yeah. doctors end up treating things very broadly. We order a, just a whole myriad of, of tests that are suggestive of the things that we're looking for. But the actual answer, you know, whether it's COVID takes one hour, four hours, two days, three days, same as blood cultures, same as wound cultures, sputum cultures, you go on and on. It takes days to get these results. And the way so, we practice mm, now is really just, well, I guess it's this, we'll treat it this way. You know, so way. you don't need to do a nasal swab for this test. Um, you, you, can, you can get along on what, uh, a, a, a chin swab, or rather a cheek swab inside your mouth. Uh, can you get along on sputum alone? So there are, you, you'll read a lot of publications out there that they're claiming, you know, sputum's so sensitive and whatnot. But then if you read the details, they're having you spit like a, a cup worth of spit, saliva. Then you concentrate. Then you get the, and finally have enough cells to get to give yourself, sorry, I have a dog that's crazy, to give yourself a signal that you can see uh, that you get a reliable readout. So um, we've tested the oral, it probably works. The saliva, it theoretically could work, but again, I don't, I don't ever want to su unnecessarily subject, um, ooh, sorry about that. It's okay. Any, I don't want to subject patients or, or lab workers. <laughs> So I don't want to suggest patients or lab workers to un any unnecessary exposure risks. So, okay, so, so what does that mean in terms of uh, the optimal way to use your test? So I, what it goes to is, uh, unfortunately, for the probably most people don't want to hear it, but the, the nasopharyngeal swab is the best. Okay. And the reason it's the best is because you, you gain the most... <laughs> Uh, material, genetic material, when you do such a swap. Well, the reason I ask is, um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of wondering whether we can develop a test uh, where the it, it can be DYI. You can do it yourself in the privacy of your own home. Yes. Um, and it, I think it's hard to do that with a nasal, a nasal test. No? Um, so when I, I have enrolled my own personal patients for the study. So, and to do that, I want to know from beginning to end where any fail point might be. So I've supervised the nasopharyngeal swabbing, the oral pharyngeal, the saliva, so that I know what is what. And I have tried to make it as easy and tolerable as I could make it for myself with the nasopharyngeal swab. And really when it comes down to it, every medical procedure that you're gonna encounter is not a pleasant experience. So um, we did it first with just a simple a q tip type swab for our, our initial studies. Those worked just fine. And um, the general swab that you get, I just had patients either insert it themselves or I would just into the, maybe about two inches, one and a half, two inches into the, the nasal, nasal cavity, let it sit for 10 seconds, twist it around a little bit, switch to the other side, let it sit for 10 seconds, switch it around a little bit, finish. It goes right into the inactivating solution and goes on from there. That's not um, painful. I, that, that's not hard to do if it's only that. Nah, it's, it's really not, it's not so bad. As far as medical procedures go, it's the bottom end of, of yeah. you know, tolerance level, I would say. So you, you say you put it into a certain solution. Does the patient do that or, or, or uh, um, does it when have I'm to be? Here, I did it myself, yeah. Mm -hmm. But to your point of home do-it-yourself testing, uh, that is something that we've been working on development in my lab for a number of years. This actual instance is more useful than anything we could have come up with before. So the home testing kit has been on the menu for quite some time, and we're really pretty close to having it where you can. We've tested it ourselves, you know, in the lab. If you're at home, what would you do? You do this. We tested it out. Voila. Works, works like a charm. So that's the hope. That okay, the so hope. you take this material that comes uh, out of the swab or off the cheek or the sputum, whatever the source yep. of it is. And how do you process this to get a reasonably reliable 
um, your response, um, you know, an answer on, on, on whether the individual is infected. Mm -hmm. So after we drop the swab, it'll be in this little solution with about a milliliter, just a little bit of fluid in it. Take it to the laboratory workspace. We use the whole um, biosafety cabinet with ventilation filters and full, full PPE gear for technicians. But theoretically, it should be inactivated already in this solution. From there, you're going to take um, a small... So you've killed the virus. You've killed the virus. You've, yes, you've made the exactly. virus inert by this time. Exactly. Yep. Right. But the genetic material should be preserved. So now we take just a small fraction of that and uh, we run it through a purification column that's uh, a quick, easy spin on the desktop. It takes about a minute to do. Now you're doing this. This is not the pay. This is not DYI. Uh, this they is done. They're finished. So yeah. uh, this is this is real world right now. So then okay. the laboratory technician takes that, cleans it up with the spin column, takes the elutins out at the bottom, adds that to a master mix, and the reaction runs. Right now, we run it for 30 minutes just because we're trying to titrate all of our times and values pretty much. Okay, this is, so this is a polymerase reading then. How does that work? So I mean, the, biochemically. Yeah, so biochemically, you have primers that we have developed, which are kind of like keys that open certain locks, and we're trying to open the COVID lock. So we have our keys that can pick that lock, and once the keys are already in the reaction well, once we add the master mix, if the COVID material is there, the keys get to work. The amplification begins with the heating aspect, which is your, your catalyst for everything to go on. You set the timer, wait 30 minutes, and you're either looking at a PCR machine output, or what I prefer is this uh, color change uh, out method where you just look at and see if it changed from a, a magenta, basically, to a, a yellow. So it's it's a color spectrum difference that is clear to even a colorblind individual. Okay, so in the first technique, the polymerase technique, rather than the heating, well, how does it present? It's not, it's not a color change. Uh, how do you read that uh, so, result? So that one's run on a real-time PCR machine. And with that one, the master... These are easy to get, right? A real-time PCR machine, easy to get. Exactly. And my recollection is that you can do 22 tests at a time with with that machine, right? Yes, yes. With the 96 well plate, uh, set, not a 96 well plate format, you can fit 22 tests on one. Um, similarly, with our color change, we're running that on a 96 well hot plate digital bath. So that one, similarly, you can do 20, you can do one at a time, you can do 22 at a time. It kind of depends what your throughput uh, and your needs are. So, um, so the machine itself will read uh, the pre presence of the virus and the machine will come out with some digital readout telling you you, exactly. have, you have the virus in this sample. Um, exactly. now, in the case of the um, color change, you have to apply heat. Where Where is the heat applied? In the machine or before or um, after the machine? The, the, the heating element is just a digital dry, it's called a digital dry bath. It's got a, a digital heating thermometer on there you set the timer or you set the the temperature and go from there so we run those for 30 minutes at 65 degrees centigrade and check the result at the end basically so if it uh, if it turns yellow did you say yep. um that that means that the the sample is in, is reflects an infection yeah it shows yep reaction was positive Okay, which one of those two methods? I guess I guess the the first method you described can be taken down to five or six or seven or eight minutes, less than ten minutes in any event. But the heat the heat system that you described that takes longer. Tell me how that works. It's, since it's a qualitative test, we want to be able to run it long enough to not miss anything at this juncture. So uh, we haven't particularly perform the experiment where you would take a picture of the the well at each moment and then you know develop mm -hmm. your own amplification curve or your time to color change in the end um instead we just do a qualitative test at the end of 30 minutes figuring that at that point we shouldn't have missed anything and the reaction should be terminated Ah, but it's interesting. Your, your, your answer suggests that you could do a kind of AI comparison throughout the 30 minutes. Sure. 
And when you see the changes, you could get a lead, you know, an early indication, so to speak, on what's going to happen. Exactly. Yeah, we'd, we'd planned a kind of a home unit where you could use your cell phone sitting on top of a little box that we created. And the cell phone could just do a time lapse shots and it would, you'd be able to then integrate all of the, the fluorescent. We were using a fluorescent system for that. So it was a little bit trickier, but we found the phone that could do it. But then uh, some updated, updated things came out from uh, the vendors for the, the lamp glimmerase. So that enabled us to do things even more simply really. But yes, this is certainly something that, that does make sense. And you could turn this into uh, values in the end. Well, that's, um, that's really a, a fabulous possibility to have it on your cell phone. So um, can you tell me, um, you know, what the, um, the, you had influences and corroboration, collaborations uh, in Japan uh, in the original design of, of one of the elements, one of the critical elements here. Uh, how did you make that connection and what did you derive from it? Okay, so um, the, the Japanese company Aiken Chemical uh, first introduced LAMP in 2000 and um, basically introduced the, the molecular technique that, that, it, that supported it. And afterward, um, they enabled scientists, researchers to use um, basically their web-based software to design isothermal amplification primers for whatever. They don't tell you what to do with it. They just say, here it is. So when I was um, first beginning my work in this area, I recognized that, you know, things need to be done in the sort of ER emergency time frame, especially when it comes to something so broad and undifferentiated as infectious diseases is. So I looked at LAMP as an obvious tool that I could hopefully adapt and, and get these kind of real-time decisions made with, with real accurate prescriptive data instead of empiric guidance. So um, I did start, I filed a patent uh, for use of isothermal amplification methods for microbial pathogen detection while I was in residency and then um, have a couple, subsequently extension patent on that and another one pending. But, uh, Basically, mine is just the, the adaptation of LAMP to uh, septic organisms. So it's pretty wide, you know, coronavirus didn't exist before, but clearly you just adapt the same sort of method. Yeah, that's great. So are, are you collaborating with them now or it's just a matter of using uh, the technology that they it developed? Be, it'd be a matter of me when I'm all finished with this, if I can get it all said and done and have it all looking really good and get an FDA license or an FDA certified product and I'd have a licensing agreement with with Aiken in place. Ah, okay. Now you have you have a couple of uh, I saw in the in the, um, the coverage in the I guess it was the Michigan State um, okay. newspaper, and you had two researchers in your photo. One was one was Lee Chinese, and yep. and one was uh, Japanese. Uh, Absolutely. And uh, I, I, uh, you know, are they American born or are they are no. they? Uh, no. They're, they're from Asia. Yeah. Yep. The secret of my success. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so Jang Gung and I have been working, uh, Dr. Lee, for a number of years now. He he was trained originally in China in kind of medical technologies and then um, had an extended period of research work at Emory University. And it was fortunate I was starting up my lab. Just, to, I guess, time goes by quickly. So, 2014 and uh, he was looking to move to Michigan so I got really lucky because he's he's got great great skills and he's he's very good at science so so that's fun and then um, I'm in the biomedical engineering building and um, once they I was getting moved over there the director Chris Kontag said oh you, know, you should meet Yuki who comes from Japan and used to work on isothermal amplification stuff so <laughs> for two I've known Yuki for a number of years as well and when this whole all started Jang was told me there's bad stuff happening in China we I'm like oh, you want to work on this he's like yeah I do so I'm like Sounds good to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we start. We started, and then Yuki had worked um, on the uh, swine flu H1N1, and 
work on a team that try, made a, a rapid test for that um, specific influenza strain back in 2009. So he had expertise in um, viral stuff with, with LAMP also, and he's a really great scientist, so he makes sure all my stuff makes sense. And So in order to develop this, this kind of uh, test, you have to have, at some point, the live virus, um, and you have, to, uh, you have to have the system in place, and mm -hmm. you have to be able to test whether the system will identify the virus. Uh, am I right? How do, you, how do you do that? You have to bring yes. in live virus. Where do you get it from, and how do you do the testing to be sure that it is uh, reliable? Yeah. So, um, originally, I used test samples acquired from emergency patients and I inactivated the, the virus and tested that. Originally, originally, we synthesized the pieces of RNA that we intended that are um, correlate with the COVID um, to adapt our tests to those. So, oh, this dog killing me. So, the, all the original testing is on, um, you know, synthetic stuff. And that's all we use when we're in our laboratory. And then after we got the synthetic uh, material to all amplify and everything made sense, and we had all our copy numbers and everything, then we made arrangements and I uh, got collaboration with Dr. John Gerlock, who runs the CLIA lab at Michigan State University. And Dr. Gerlock was able to get us state samples that were archived uh, positives from uh, various sources that had been extracted and, and tested with uh, the gold standard method and found to be positive. So we have 30 positive and 30 negative of those, which are live viruses, virus uh, you know, samples in a viral transport media. So then we had to adapt our, our methods to account for this viral transport media. And it's kind of, kind of this weird, oh, no, no. this weird solution of stuff that we had to, you know, basically figure out how to, how to work with it to get our samples to answers to match up with theirs. Mm -hmm. so, I'm sorry. That's okay. This is, uh, you know, what we do here at Think Tank. We, it's, What's that? Uh, it's, it's cinema real, you know. <laughs> Ridiculous dog. Okay. So, so Brett, um, how how um, how effective, how reliable is the test, both in the first mode, the polymerase, and in the in the heating and the heating system you've developed? So, with I think the most updated results. I haven't heard all the, today we're almost finished with that, all those 60 samples that, that, I, that I spoke of. So uh, the first week or so was needed to kind of tinker around with those and see sometimes they worked and others didn't. And then our internal control had problems. So we, then it makes it difficult to uh, how, see how reliable the test is. So we had to make some tweaks and improvements on the processing. Uh, these are for the the, the samples that, no, that come samples that come from the the hospital or the state lab. So once those tweaks were all done, then um, then we were able to proceed. And I'd say our accuracy right now using a Roche thermocycler machine are about seventy five percent or so. And then for the color change method, un un unexpectedly, they were, were higher, probably more like 85% uh, right now. So um, that's about where we're at for those But you're shooting, you're shooting for 100%. How do you uh, get yeah. from where you are? I mean, it's, do you have a, a plan uh, to get from where you are to 100%? Oh, certainly. <laughs> uh, we, we've done some some concentration sort of steps that, that help quite a bit and then um, I can't really go back and recheck some of them because we exhausted the archive so we're going to end up importing new ones and now of course the tidal wave is kind of past us it seems so the number of I, I did have two uh, positive patients 
when I worked in the emergency department two nights ago in Lansing. So it's not all gone. And certainly I think there's great potential for a rebound effect. So we'll see. In the meantime, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I've got. I think we can get up in the 90s pretty easily, but uh, that's where I want to be, more or less. Sure. Where, were the, where are the other tests that are out there? Are they in the 90s? I don't think so, no. I mean, if you do the, the gold standard with the, and I, I believe we would get up to 100, you know, if we did the full extraction. But I'm really trying to squeeze, you know, what's like a three or four hour process down into like one or two minutes. So the sacrifice you pay is, you know, you, yeah. you're going to lose some, I think. Is there any risk? Is there any risk to this test? I don't know. Maybe there's no risk to any of them. You're not, you're not in, inserting virus either alive or dead into the uh, individual. So where would the risk be, if any? Uh, no one likes to get the wrong answer, right? No one, you don't want to tell someone they have something terrible and they don't. That's yeah, yeah. ethically undefensible. And, yeah. and uh, so that's, that's the risk. Like, there's not really a treatment for this. It's all supportive care. We've treated the same, all these viruses are supportive care, but it's still better to know for everyone if you've got it, right? Yeah. That's, uh, this this may be outside your thinking, but uh, you know one of the things that's occurred to me is we we have all these cumulative totals of tests that have been taken in the U.S. and then you know when you make a cumulative te uh, total over a, a, say a two month period, you're going to get a total that mm, that is that's cumulative, but it's not now necessarily. And if you were going to make an effective testing protocol, um, I don't know if you thought about this, but how often would you test a given population. Seems to me with this test, you could test them a lot. You could test them anytime you feel like it. You know, going back to Trump's comment, anybody who wants a test can get a test. You can test them over and over again, which I think is what you've got to do. You've got to have multiple tests, not just cumulative numbers. Pretty much, I would say so. We don't know too, I, I know that people do clear the virus. I see that it goes away over time. People who bounce back to the ER a bunch of times keep getting tested and then suddenly it's gone. I do also hear of cases where people should not reasonably have not recovered, right? So it's like they were sick, they were testing positive, a month has gone by, they're still sick and they're still positive. Mm -hmm. So that is, that's tricky. Did they get sick twice? Did they ever recover? So these kind of questions are difficult to answer. You know, one of the things that's been uh, in discussion in the newspaper is uh, how many, how many uh, virion viral particles um, do, you have, do you have to have in order to develop a disease? And I, I don't know if there's been any real conclusion on that. But it seems to me if you've got one, one particle, that's probably not going to make you sick. Yeah. But if you have a com you know a, a lot of particles that you've gotten from multiple sources over a long period of time, uh, those particles are more likely to make you sick. So um, does is that consistent with your understanding? And can we ever make a test that would um, determine um, you know the the vigor the the vigor, the vitality of these particles, so we know how how much infection is going on in a you know a, quant a quantitative way in the individual. Yeah, it's hard for hard for me to say because it, when you're doing, I have again now these undifferentiated samples from the state lab. They could be your sputum, saliva, nasopharyngeal wash, swab, any any sort of thing in there in a, an aliquot of this viral transport media. Um, the state lab samples, I haven't, I don't, I keep myself off the, what the real ones look like. And, but we do have a, a quantitative real-time PCR output for each of them. So it will be curious for me when we do our final analysis to see uh, where the cutoff for our misses might be. And if we're missing ones that are way out there, then that would, that would uh, kind of explain some things like mm -hmm. that we're basically without an a, a extensive extraction, not gonna have the sensitivity necessary. But it's, it's curious because uh, the patients that I've sampled from who were positive were at, I would say mild, mild to moderate maybe level of illness and their positivity is like 
ten thousand greater than ten thousand copies per per reaction. Well, well over. And again, the reactions when they're positive, it's like five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, eight minutes. So, so. Would would the test uh, that you're developing um, read positive for only a handful of particles? So you you have to do the limit of detection determination for all of them. Um, basically, in vitro is the only way you can do it. And our, our copy numbers down at like uh, 620, 650 or 325, something like that at the lowest end of the detection limit. And that's just as low as our primers can go. And below that, it, it just it won't really work. It won't, won't so, really work. Yeah. So you'll see. You know Last thing I want to ask you uh, yeah. is is about the uh, the approval process, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know it's troubling because this uh, it's it's troubling that you can't get approval right away. Uh, the first time I saw your you know your report in the newspaper was on April tenth. That's over a month ago. Yeah. And at the time you said it'll take a month, um, you know, to get approval from there was I think there was a government laboratory you had to get through, and then you had to go to the FDA. Uh, so my question is, yeah. where are you on that approval continuum? And how long is it going to take? And why does it take so long? If there's, if there's no risk on this, and if you can establish a certain amount of reliability, it should be five minutes, as long as the test itself, five minutes. Why is it taking so long? Uh, so to answer the question, to be fair, I didn't, I wasn't able to get the laboratory space to actually begin the operation until I think three weeks ago today. So that's when I was able to get the lab. Then we were able to get the samples from the state. That became like a Friday. So now, you know, Friday, now it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Started running samples. Didn't really know what we were dealing with there because they were just, you know, tubes that had, you know, stuff in it. We had to figure out how to deal with that. The fact that it was a live virus and inactivating it and lysing the cells and then cleaning up whatever is in there and amplifying the product. All of these things had to be figured out. So, um, and then, you know, we're kind of like a little, you saw the operation size, three, three individuals, you know, I still, I kind of help coordinate and keep all the experiments going and try to debug when the problems hit and, you know, overall, everybody else is either getting the work done or trying to make things better and, you know, overall validate it. Um, so it's taking a while just with only a few of us. And, um, and as far as the FDA submission process goes, I am not really a person who likes to keep redoing the same kind of work over and over again. So we've already done all the preliminary, you know, limits of detection and all of that's done on the paperwork. But what I really want is the numbers from the valid validated samples. So literally maybe today, maybe tomorrow, we're finally finished with that original 60. I've already got a few of my own that I can bring in. But, you know, as with anything in science, it's like, what kind of swabs did you use? What kind of media was it in? What kind of timing did we do? You know, all of these things need to be uh, very precise. And I don't, I don't malign the, the FDA approval process myself because I get it. There's just a ton of quackery out there, people trying to make a quick buck and sell you some garbage. Um, I've, I've been doing this too long and I take it too seriously to be doing that. So, you know, when it's all, if it all works out perfect and great, it's so easy. But, you know, the real world throws you some... Uh, yeah. Well, in the real in the real world, let's assume you know that your numbers impress them. Let's assume that uh, they say, "Hmm, this is really good because it's fast, and we need fast, and mm -hmm. we need easy, uh, and we want to do this." So, Brett, go ahead. You know, get it started. What happens then? You know, you're effectively in a spot where you have to commercialize, mm -hmm. where you either have to have a contract or a capital uh, to manufacture and distribute. This yep. is not easy because, um, you know, the demand is just huge. And uh, although the White House says, oh, you know, we, we, we've, we've, uh, we've prevailed on this, um, we have it. And, um, and the key to reopening the economy is the ability to, to do an intelligent testing. Everybody agrees on that. Yep. So uh, the demand will be just extraordinary. How can this system meet that demand? 
Oh, I believe it can. I mean, all the vendors and all of the, the materials that go into making my tests are all from legitimate, you know, quality controlled sources. So it isn't really much of a cowboy operation at all, I would say. Um, everything has been put together scientifically. And they're, again, they're all big vendors. So when it comes down to it, they're more like, how big is the order? That's about all. And yeah. the way my method works, it doesn't encroach on the other other systems that are out there it's just a, a bypass freeway so it's it's not really shouldn't hinder the rest of the system in, in any major way so well so <clears throat> we're in a time when we really need your we need your system and um um <clears throat> i mean i i have a for what it's worth i have a really good feeling about what you're doing I, I, uh, in, in all ways and uh, uh, for what it's worth, I, I hope that after you succeed in this and the FDA approves it, um, and you have all these uh, manufacturers manufacturing it all over the world for 8 billion people, uh, I hope you'll still talk to me. Oh, heck yeah. I'm, I'm a little, I, Michigan's lovely, but, and I grew up in California, but uh, I'm every year, right about Christmas, I can't help it. I started looking to move to Hawaii for, <laughs> Well, at least beyond right now, almost in Michigan, is barely warm here yet. <laughs> Brett Etchabon, uh in MSU, working on some really fabulous technology. Thank you so much. Brett. Thank you very much, Jay. I appreciate it. Aloha. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Aloha. Thanks.